Uh, via telephone, Delegate Wayne Clark joins us now. Wayne, good morning to you, sir. Good morning to everybody. We're hanging hey, in Jonathan, there, man. Make sure you say something positive about me so my stock goes up, too. <laughs> yeah, baby. Wayne, I, I am excited because golf season's just about here. Oh, 80 degrees today. Oh. I'm stuck inside this building. Yes, dying. me too. I want to. I want to hit balls today. I got to come down and, and play down there a number of times this spring. I love your course. Come on down. We uh, we we got blessed this year. We're hosting a USGA event for the second time, so I'm really excited about that. Sweet. Yeah. Go ahead and plug the course, Wayne. Yeah. So uh, you know we're uh, we're coming out of winter now, and uh, it's been a really nice, uh, relaxed uh, winter. So hopefully March uh, treats us nice, but uh, we got a lot of exciting things coming along this year, a lot of great charity events that we're going to be hosting. So if you're not following us on Facebook, uh, Locust Hill Golf Course, comma, WV, uh, make sure you're following us to keep track of all these uh, charity events we have coming up throughout the year. Wayne is the delegate from the 99th Delegate District and the Vice Chair of Economic Development and Tourism. What bills are coming through, Wayne, that will help economic development and tourism uh, from your perspective the most? And, and uh, so, you can say form energy if you want. That's fine. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. So on another note, um, <laughs> so we, we have a lot of um, really good um, – trail bills that are coming along, um, you know, working with the uh, railroads on some of their, um, you know, rails that they're not using anymore. Maybe they've been abandoned or maybe they're not active uh, and turning them into trails, working with um, the DEP on, uh, it's a program that uh, we actually started in the city of Charlestown, um, our vacant property board uh, back in 2011 and 12 when we uh, uh got home rule. So DEP has actually taken that project and is has expanded on it to help some of the buildings that are, you know, they they've been sitting there falling apart, tax liens, that kind of stuff, um, to give the municipalities an opportunity to you know, maybe tear those down and find another another owner maybe wants to build on those, uh, put some restaurants in, uh, gift shops, things like that to enhance the uh, trails that we're working on. Um, we have a lot of uh, really good tax incentives for companies to come into the state, um, you know, especially, uh, you know, businesses that we don't have. Um, one of them, I'll give you an example, is a uh, heavy-duty truck manufacturer. So there is a uh, federal excise tax that we currently do not collect. And so any of anybody who's coming in that wants to build these types of heavy-duty trucks, you know, Mack trucks, you know, these um, uh, in the area, in the state, they're going to get a tax deferred for a few years uh, to help them build, um, you know, the, the business and get get moving. And, uh, you know, our, our local delegate, Mike Hornby, has a really good bill that helps for small businesses, uh, House Bill 3007 that we're trying to get out of finance. Um, and that bill gives a... Uh, uh, a credit towards a small business for the first few years on their payroll tax, um, and that's one of the you know the one of the biggest expenses that they may have is that payroll tax, you know, outside of just payroll. So it gives them an opportunity to hire new new uh, employees and and know that the state's behind them. So uh, another good bill that we have. Any odds of that getting passed right now? My understanding is from having Mike on Wednesday that anything that has a price tag associated right now is on hold. Uh, you are correct, you know, and that's that, that's the scary part. You know, on the education side, we have, uh, you know, a couple of uh, bills that do some restructuring of the charter schools, some things that we missed in the original uh, bill. And that is sitting there, again, has a price tag. So um, they're all kind of holding. And that is due to the PEIA and the uh, personal prop, uh, personal income tax. You know, um, those two have uh, pretty significant price tags. And if we can get those across the finish line, uh, maybe in the last week we can get some of these other bills that have um, some fiscal notes on them to move, but uh, right now it's it's you know very difficult to get anything that has a fiscal note uh, 
uh, through right now. Wayne, I got a tax question for you. We were talking to Jason Baker a little bit earlier, Martinsburg City Council. The hotel tax, is there, has there has there been any talk to allow the municipalities to raise their hotel tax above the 2% cap right now? Because it seems like that's bringing money in from people who aren't in the state, and a lot of other states have much higher hotel taxes, where they're getting a lot more money from West Virginians than we're getting from outsiders, which would help to, you know, help the municipalities to not need as much state funding, which would put more funding back to the state that you could then use for PEIA education, other things. You know, that's a good question, and uh, I don't recall seeing anything come across um, on the House side in regards to raising of the uh you know hotel motel tax um you know i've seen a couple bills that uh you know did some uh changes to how those that money was spent um and probably had a little bit of a harm on the municipalities um but those bills have not moved forward but uh that's not a that's not a bad idea i mean you know even if we only raise it a half a percent you know, that gives, you know, the uh, municipalities this additional um, option for for um, other types of tourism. Well, it's, and it's taxing, for the most part, people that don't live in West Virginia overwhelmingly. I mean, other states have, you know, a lot of toll roads, higher motel hotel taxes. It's about time that, that we get more money from, from people coming here like they're getting when, when we travel elsewhere. Yes, I agree. I was talking to uh, Larry Swan uh, the other day. We were we were discussing some of the uh, the intricate parts of uh, the Charlestown Hollywood Casino racetrack. You know, um, about ninety percent of their overall income comes from out of state, and ninety percent of their employees are from in the state. You know, that's a that's a pretty solid uh, uh, balance. You know, and if we can get you know that happening on on all of our border counties throughout the state you know with hotels and motels and attractions and you know i think that's a good thing for the state mr gilstrap well i'm going to go back to the whole income tax um bill and the compromise with the between the house and the senate uh from your perspective well first of all if well the underlying question is how we doing the other question is from your perspective when we look at all that is on the table in the in the difference between the senate bill and the house bill with the uh, personal property tax rebate and the elimination of the marriage penalty and just the sheer difference between a 15 percent and a 50 percent uh cut in the income tax where do you see the points of most obvious compromise so i i from what I'm reading by the House is Amendment 2 failed, um, and Amendment 2 failed hard during the election cycle. So if we have a bill that comes across that is dealing with uh, rebating the personal, you know, for the automobiles and, and the business inventory tax, it's going to be hard uh, to see the House as a whole um, move on that. That's what I'm seeing. Um, in regards to whether it's 15%, whether it's 50%, whether it's 25%, um, the House we're in, we're in a position something's got to be done. You know, we you know we our citizens need their money back. You know, so you know when you when you look at some of the other options such as the you know the Senate's version with the um, you know, giving a rebate back, um, you know, from my understanding, uh, that rebate then follows into a 1099 for the following year. So when you get a 1099, you know, you've got to pay taxes on that money. So you're going to pay taxes on, on the rebate the following year. You know, um, I, I, I don't see how that's beneficial. We have to pay taxes on a tax rebate? Well, if... I mean, if you think about it, if the state issues a 1099 for the, re- you know, the following year because you took the rebate, you got to pay taxes on the 1099. That's 1099 income. There's no taxes that was taken on that. So that's what I'm hearing. That you know, um, I'm leaving you know the tax stuff to the, you know, the guys on finance. You know, I have enough on my plate. 
Um, and then once finance is done, you know, they'll put the caucus together and they'll explain everything uh, down the line. But, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm correct, if you're getting a rebate from the state, you're going to receive a 1099. Do you think there's any bias against the Eastern Panhandle by some other legislators where they're when they're talking about lowering the overall tax rate? just because there are a lot of counties where they don't have a lot of people who are really paying much state tax where this would benefit because our incomes are a lot higher it would benefit a lot more people up here well i don't think uh, i don't think there's just a bias in regards to personal income tax i think there's a bias to the eastern panhandle overall you know uh, luckily for us the eastern panhandle we have our own little caucus and we meet weekly and we discuss issues that are important to the Eastern Panhandle, and we stay together. But uh, there is a bias to the Eastern Panhandle overall, without it, without a doubt. And the rest of the state, there are there are a lot of counties in the state that under have to understand that they would not have, you know, basically anything if they did not have the tax revenue that was generated in the Eastern Panhandle that goes to Charleston and doesn't come back here. They should be a little more thankful, and it should be a little less acrimonious toward us. Well, I, I even go as far as this is that, uh, you know, when you have, um, you know, folks, um, every part of the state of West Virginia, it's it's one of the beauty parts about about the state. There's so many diverse, you know, regions, and you have everybody has their own unique problems, you know, in, in their area and. A lot of the misconception is we don't have any problems in our area. We're we're just hunky dory because you know we have all this tax money coming in, you know, to the state, and they don't realize that, you know, we have infrastructure issues, we have job issues, we have, you know, transportation issues. I mean, we have so many other issues that many many parts of the state just don't even know. Delegate Wayne Clark is our guest here on the program. Wayne, what do you know about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that's being discussed in Charleston? Yeah, so um, that is a bill that has been um, passed. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, that is a bill that's been introduced uh, several years in a row, um, and it is basically what it's saying is that you know you can claim a religious freedom for you know whatever it may be, um, and it just gives those who have many of the religious beliefs. You know, I'll go. I'll go as far as you know. Um, you know, I. I my religious uh, belief is that I do not receive medication. So if I'm hospitalized for something, I'm not to receive any medication. Some some religions are that are that, you know that that heavy, you know, and you know basically what it says is I choose my religious freedom rather than you know what society says. So you know it's a uh, I, is it a controversial bill? Maybe I don't know. Um, it's something that if comes across me uh, on the floor that you know I'll probably vote for uh, to pass. You know, um, I haven't, I don't have necessarily any any concerns. I mean, I have my my own personal beliefs, and everybody else has their own personal beliefs, and I think everybody should be allowed to have their personal beliefs. Is there, what are the restrictions as to what my religious freedom is versus how it might infringe on somebody else's freedom? Well, I mean, you got to look at okay, you know, vaccines as an example. You know, so um, you know, our state requires that you know kids are va- vaccinated before going to, you know, kindergarten for certain things. Um, you know, like measles, mumps, uh, rubella. I I I can't list all of them. You know, but if you claim a religious freedom. And you say, well, I don't believe in the vaccines because I don't believe in medicine. You know, I believe in natural immunity. Um, you know, should that child be allowed in the public schools? And we had a state Supreme Court ruling, and I can't remember the exact uh, year on that, um, that said that that's not the case for public schools because of the best interest of the public. So, you know, nowadays, you know, it's kind of changed from um, when that Supreme Court ruling came out. Um, and, you know, majority of us have those, you know, have been vaccinated for those types of uh, rare diseases. And uh, potentially it's not as big of an issue now as it may have been, say, in the 80s or the 90s. But, you know, that, that's kind of 
an example I can give you. So what would be the parameters for what's an acceptable religion? Because that's usually not that difficult to attain to the status of a particular religion. And that's a good question. You can start a new church out of anything, and you can then set your beliefs down out of anything. I, you could, you know. Um, you know, and I would have to say I'm unable to answer that at this point. You know, what is the you know definition of my religion versus your religion um, and what the difference is? I think it comes down to individual choice. You know, if the the key w- with regards specific, specifically to the inoculations is to attend public school. There's no law that says you have to have get your kid vaccinated if you go to home school. I don't think. But mm. if you if you are going to play if, if you're going to play in the public playground as in the school, then you have to play by the public rules. Now, we could argue whether or not those those are justifiable rules. But as far as the argument that that if if Charlie Little Charlie does not get vaccinated against polio, and my kid does get vaccinated against polio. My kid is protected from polio, irrespective of what Little Charlie does. Now, the long-term mutations and such of viruses that are allowed to to catch up again are are a problem. But I don't know. I, I this it just seems like a lot of noise over not a big problem. You know, it's, it's like a solution in search of a problem. Well, and. In- I think your close right there is exactly the situation we're in. You know, a lot of noise over, is it a big problem? What is our big problem? PIA, personal income tax, that's our big problem. You know, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of noise over a lot of other things um, that potentially are not as big of a problem as those two. Are you back to being able to actively discuss these bills today, or are you still in a state of suspended limbo? We, as of right now, we are still in the. Um, when we left on, um, in a, when we left on Tuesday afternoon for the first recess, we had thirty-seven bills on third and second reading, and I actually had three of my education bills as the last three on third reading for that day. Um, and now I'm just doing a rough run. It looks like we're down to 15. So, you know, we have, uh, we're still in this limbo mode of, you know, we don't know what's coming up next. Do you think PEIA will get the, the changes that are needed will, will happen this, this year? No. Will this be the year? I say zero chance. Rob says no. John Gilstrap. Be, how can they not? Good. It's going to be on the governor. I think right now we've just been filling with some money, but there's no long-term funding mechanism. Right. Or at this point, there's no real serious legislation that I have read, Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong, that addresses the rising health care costs that everybody's subjected to. But PEIA, because of the ability of you folks to backfill the needed amount for that year, has not yet had to change. Yeah, the request this year is roughly about $143 million to backfill it. Meanwhile, we still have we have hospitals after hospitals after hospitals that are saying we're not taking PEIA anymore because the reimbursement rate's too low. Correct. They would rather they would rather you know make a living. I mean, we've got some hospitals that are we've got some hospitals in the state that are struggling. I mean, WVU thankfully is taking over a lot of struggling hospitals, as is Valley Health, and I think uh, UPMD <laughs> is. Uh, uh, Pittsburgh, I think they're trying to take over University of Pittsburgh hospitals, yep. trying to take over a few also. Well, John, you're an insurance guy. If I have insurance that nobody's going to take, it's almost like not having insurance. Exactly. exactly. So it has to be fixed. I mean, somehow, otherwise... <laughs> well, if they only have a certain amount of providers, a certain amount of beds, a certain amount of, of things they can do, they can't, they can't service the people they're getting paid a lot lower percentage and still be a profitable model. Let me get back to Wayne here real quick before we run out of time with him. Uh, Wayne, uh, Certificate of Need... Any legislation progress there uh, before the end of this? We did move session. a bill out of the Senate um, that uh, that um, gives a repeal for imaging, um, and that is making its way over here to the to the House through uh, um, uh, House Health, and hopefully it makes it to the floor. And what that basically what that does is gives um, uh, 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 some of your like. Um, 
your smaller urgent cares, uh, Valley Health is one up in uh, Spring Mills, uh, gives them the opportunity to have a imaging center right there. So if somebody comes in um, in an emergency situation, they can do the imaging there instead of, you know, oh, well, sorry, you know, it looks like you're, you've are you dislocated your, your knee. Uh, it's going to take about three weeks for us to get an MRI on it. Um, here's some pain pills uh, to try and you know, make it for the next three weeks, and then we'll get your MRI. Uh, this will allow them to have the imaging center right there um, and be able to get these uh, MRIs done right away. And on that so note, Wayne, that I, one, i got to cut you off because we're out of time. Sure. I want to thank you for yours, sir. We'll have you back again before the session's over if you have time. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Take thank care, you, Wayne. Wayne. Take care.